Church Mission Spotlight. Let us learn a secret dynamic of the Liberty Mission Celebration. Exponential returns on our investments. Simply understood, becoming more and more rapid. We illustrate this truth through this spotlight on the John Barnes family. Did you know that three of our missionary families are related? 15 years ago, Two missionary sisters, Regina and Rachel, with their respective husbands, participated in our very own Liberty Baptist Mission celebration. And so, we were introduced to Rachel and Brian Weed and to Regina and Tom Franklin. Brian and Rachel Weed started their own missionary celebration experiences in Nicaragua, where they have seen God blessing in exponential growth through church planting and training of dedicated and talented national leadership. However, the growth cannot be contained to one country. So the weeds branched out into Costa Rica, Panama, Venezuela, and Haiti. As recent prayer letters are announcing, the weed celebration vision is to reach all of Latin America. So we see how our investments are reaping multiplied dividends. Tom and Regina Franklin in their ministry have been reaching the peoples of Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. Their partnership with God is not only planting local churches, but is raising up national leadership to preach more effectively in the spread of the gospel in these countries. Through their efforts, God not only is adding souls to the churches, but he is multiplying the efforts of the Franklins. This, in effect, is exponentially increasing our missionary investments. To conclude this month's spotlight, we now look at Rachel and Regina's parents, John and Carrie Barnes. The Barnes are long-term missionaries who have seen God work in amazing ways over these many years. To give you just an idea, God graciously closed out the 2020 worldwide COVID pandemic year for the Barnes with these amazing dividends. Average AM online attendance 4,220, recorded salvations for the 2020 year, 958, recorded baptisms, 322, there were 138 national leaders in training, 50 home Bible studies, and three new churches planted in a COVID year. Liberty Baptist shareholders are not simply donating missionary offerings. We are investing in multiplied dividends. Our earthly missionary celebration will literally explode when we get to heaven and witness the multitude of thousands of souls saved through our sacrificial giving. Amen. Some uh, things to rejoice in when you say, we aren't here just for social reasons. We do have a lot of social things going on, and that's a good thing. But we're here to carry out the great commission of the Lord. He said, go into all the world. And so you're such a terrific testimony among churches. I spoke to a veteran missionary this week. They call me from time to time because we do a lot of projects and our giving was over 400000 last year for missions. And he simply said to me, I know of three churches, of all the churches I know, that do what you do. Now that's sad. I wish every church, I pray that every church will have such a great interest in the souls of men. That's what's going to really count on that day when we're raptured up with the Lord, is how many are going with us, right? Amen? Uh, is this on, My, Micah, did you turn them? It's on? Okay. I said, on that day when we get to heaven with a rapture from all over the world, we're going to rejoice at what God has done through our individual and together gifts for the Lord. Amen? Amen? Oh, I love that. I love that. That's good. Now, 
I always like to leave our young people. We have a lot of good young people in our church, and I like to help you any way I can. I know that some of you girls are looking for a pr prospective uh, boyfriend. I know that boys are looking for girlfriends. And so I want to help you with this, boys, if I can. This will help you with the girl of your dreams. Here are things that will ruin your dates, though. So you've got to be careful what you say. I really don't like this restaurant that much, but I wanted to use this two-for-one coupon before it expired. <laughs> uh, I refuse to get cable. That's how they keep tabs on you. And I used to come here all the time with my ex-girlfriend. And then, could you excuse me? My cat gets lonely if he doesn't hear my voice on the answering machine every hour. I really feel that I've grown in the last few years. Used to be, I wouldn't have given someone like you a second look. That's not what you want to say. It's been tough, but I've come to accept that most people I date just won't be as smart as I am. Now, that's a way to ruin your future life. So avoid those things at all costs, right? Amen. You know, uh, I still try to play golf, such as it is, uh, at my age and condition and back and everything for relaxation, maybe one day a week or one every, every couple of weeks, depending on the weather. And uh, I, I like to do that. I read where this man was walking in the city when he was accosted by a particularly dirty and shabby looking bum who asked him for a couple of dollars for dinner. The man took out his wallet, extracted a couple of dollars, and asked, now, will you spend this money on green fees at a golf course? He said, are you nuts? I haven't played golf in over 20 years. The man said, well, I'm not going to give you $2. Instead, I'm going to take you to my wife, and I'm going to take you home for a terrific dinner cooked by my wife. And so he was astounded. He said, well, won't your wife be furious for doing that? I know I'm dirty and probably smell pretty bad. The man said, that's okay. I just want her to see what a man looks like who's given up golf. <laughs> this will help you guys a little bit. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. Uh, all, all of us as Christians are in turmoil from time to time from too much politics, watching television. We're in turmoil with personal problems. There are many things that are happening to us that can cause us not to have peace. If I were to say this and you were to be candid and really honest, isn't your quest for peace a major priority in your life uh, from all the, all the things that are going on? Well, I want to talk to you about what Jesus said for everyone who will listen about peace. You say, well, that's a simple word. Yes, it is. But do you have it? Do you have it all the time? Well, Hardly anybody has it all the time, but Jesus gave us how we can, a practical way, as believers, have peace. And if you don't have peace, you don't have much of anything. I say that, and it's astounding, but it's, and it's dramatic, but it's absolutely true. Let's look at what Jesus said in the early part of his ministry in Matthew. We're going to take our text from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. So, Robert, if you would put that up for us. And then if you have your Bible, look on your Bible. Some of you have your Bible on your phone, so forth. But whatever, we have it on the screens for you if you do not bring your Bibles. And seeing the multitudes, and there were a lot of people following Jesus. You know, God has set it so that his truth is going to prevail. In the days of Jesus, the Pharisees, religious people, Sadducees, Herodians and others broke off into different beliefs and so forth. But their primary thing was they kept all they felt of the worship of God to the elite ones themselves. And they ignored the poor people who were well not educated. They did not, were not brought up in the temple. They were looked upon as not worthy to worship Jehovah. The elite we're talking about. So there was, there was a put down, there was a worthlessness from high hierarchy of religion and also politics because religious leaders were also politicians serving in the Sanhedrin. That is, they helped make the laws and they were the religious rulers. And remember this, that every politician has a religion of some kind. Usually it's universalism. Usually it's their own idea of eliteness. It's those kind of things. 
Therefore, you and I who believe the Bible are nothing in their minds. But boy, that's a strong statement, Pastor. Well, research it like I have and you'll find out. If you're not a universalist, that is, you don't believe that all religions are the same and all cultures are the same. If you don't believe that and you can't believe that if you're a Bible believer, it is impossible. Jesus said you cannot serve God and this world's culture. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. So a Bible believer knows that. We know that. But we pay a price for it. We are looked upon as kooks, as fanatics, as stupid, going out to church on Sunday when it could rain. <laughs> oh, going out to, you, you know, if, if you will study this very carefully, there is one uniting factor about all religions, and that is they believe that if you do not accept all religions, you are outcast, you are nobody. When you take up the cross of Christ, he said, don't be surprised if they're going to treat you like they treated me, which was crucifixion. And you'd better get over the idea, well, if I become a believer and I share my faith and I live for God, everybody's going to love me. Where did you get that propaganda? It isn't in the Bible. We pay a price for serving the Lord. We're discriminated against we are persecuted sometimes by our own families. Therefore, we don't have peace. We have this turmoil. Well, maybe I'm going too far. Maybe I should believe in all gods. Maybe No, no, that's, that's Satan's way of giving you turmoil and taking away your peace. So let's look at this. But Jesus told the truth. The Bible says the people heard him gladly because he spoke as one having authority. He not only had the miracles, he knew the law. He explained the complicated things of all the laws that the Pharisees, Sadducees, and others made. Therefore, the people felt worthless, alienated from God, were not welcome in the temple. And by the way, you don't want to let a church get like that. We want people to come and hear the word of God. This, is, this church is not controlled by a family or two. It's controlled by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of this church. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me. So we have a wana. We have a Christian school. We have Bible school. We have all those things because we love the children. Why do we love the children? Because Jesus loved the children. Amen. Why do we love the poor and down and out? Because Jesus loved them. We've started three pregnancy centers. We've done a lot of things. Why? Because Jesus loves people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And let's not get the idea that just because God has blessed us in such a marvelous way, he's blessed us for our selfish reasons. He has blessed us to become generous. And if you have not become generous in your heart to reach other people, you are not like God. You're not like Jesus Christ. Self-centered people are not good Christians, maybe not Christians at all. Let that soak in for a minute. So Jesus goes up into a mountain. There's a plain below. And I've been there to that part of the world. It's like God created it as an amphitheater. And he began to talk to them in, in simple language, something all could grasp, and here's what he said. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now, look at this, if you will, please. And here's what he said. And he opened his mouth, taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I won't comment on that today. I like to teach on this section, though. Then he said, verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Then he said, Blessed are the meek. That's power under control. That's humility. Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you better learn how to be humble. God resists the proud. We are not to be proud in our own selves. What talent do we have that God didn't give us? Now, I know that from faith. I often bring up Bob because he's been with us since he was a teenager. He and Karen have been in this church. They were married in this church. He went to Liberty University. And I'm going to tell you that there was something mysterious about what he gave to Bob that I don't have. Someone said, Do you got, can you play the piano? Well, I don't know. But I know I don't have the touch he has. I took piano lessons one time. 
The uh, piano teacher quit. <laughs> no good. You've got, maybe you've got talent to serve other people and compassion and patience that I don't have. That's a gift from God. All of us have talents, whether we use them for God or not. So he says all these kind of things. Let me finish this up because I know you're getting tired of standing. I, I like it when you have to stand a few minutes, but I don't push it. I don't push it because I know you don't have to come here. You don't, you, but see, I, I stand all the time, and I like to stand. Don't you? Yes. No? Okay, well, I'll let you sit down just a minute. <laughs> Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, not peacekeepers, and I'll show you the difference, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we know that you promise, and every promise is, is kept. We know that every prophetical utterings of the Old and New Testament, and there are hundreds of them, have come to pass. We know that your word is true. We've proven it not only in life, but proven it in the scripture. We see it working in millions and millions of lives all around the world. We praise you for these promises and truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, having read this, I want to show you only about three great things today, maybe four, about peace. Number one, God is not at this time a peacekeeper. He will be in the millennium, but not now. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms, God has given us as human beings the, the ability under certain limitations where we can keep peace on the earth. But ironically, it's never happened. Let me show you how how it has not happened. In, the over, in, in over 3,100 years, we have recorded world history. The world has only been at peace 8% of the time, or a total of 286 years, out of 3,100 years of keeping records. As a total of 80, 286 years and 8,000 treaties, agreements, among nations, so forth, have been made and broken. Some countries have broken every one, and now it's getting less and less because we know it's not going to keep them anyway. But people keep pouring money and politicians keep pursuing treaties and things that are not going to work. They never have worked, and they're not going to work because only Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and when he establishes peace on this earth, it will be total and it will be awesome. All right, listen carefully. What most people, and in fact it appears that peacekeeping doesn't work at all. Not only does peacekeeping not offer any solutions to a conflict, quite often the peacekeeper themselves get shot. What most people don't seem to understand is that peace is not something that can be imposed from the outside, which politicians, governments tend to do, you cannot keep a peace that isn't there. Think about that. You can't keep a peace that isn't there. As individuals, I want to give you three areas we should work on. If you want a better life, more abundant life, if you're a Christian, a believer in Christ, and if you're not in Christ, you're never going to have peace. As you pursue life, it's going to get worse. As you pursue life, you're going to get older and more sick. As you pursue life, you're going to make more enemies. And if you're in Christ, you can improve all that and become victorious over that if you really trust the Word of God. Now, let's, let's look at this. I want to show you some scriptures that I think will help you and will be a blessing to you, if you will. Number one, I want you to notice that we, first of all, must pursue peace with God. You say, well, I'm not mad at God. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible says that those of you who were at enmity with God, what does that mean? Well, the Bible says he that believeth not in him is condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, John 3, 17 and 18. If you will look at Luke 2, 14, you will find out that God 
<coughs> excuse me, is the author of peace. What do I mean by that? God must put peace inside us if we have real peace. You say, wait a minute, I, I, I do pretty good with people. Well, our pretty good is not, po- is not really the potential we have. You know how I have peace with other Christians, other pastors, other people? Is you, it takes a negotiation. What do I mean by that? Well, I negotiate with the Lord to believe the Bible. The Apostle Paul said, Who art thou that judges another man's servant? The first thing Christians need to do is stop judging one another and accept others by the fruit of our life. Now, if we don't have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, so forth, then we will not have the joy of the Lord. And it's easily understood by other people because the outward attitude knows that you don't have peace. Arguments are frequent. Quarreling is a lot. Marriages get into all kinds of trouble today. Have you noticed that marriages are getting shorter and shorter and more multiplied? Why do you think that is? Well, there are three major areas that couples disagree about and argue about. And I'm not going to go over those today, but one of them is money. One of them is how to do things. One of them is how they're going to live. They have to negotiate the peace they have, but if they don't have the peace in here, they're not going to have the peace of the negotiation of living with each other. Men in this area talk too much. Where in the world did you get the idea that if you get married, you're going to agree with your wife all the time? So stupid. You know, ignorant can be helped, but stupid is forever. (laughs) Don't talk too much. Be quiet. Well, I was right. Well, just enjoy being right with yourself. (laughs) And if you get to talk to your mother, if she doesn't tattle all the time, you could tell her that you were right. That's good. But that's not how it really is. Because peace, now listen to this, if you will write this down, if you will put this in something you can memorize, peace is never attained externally until peace is had internally in your own heart and mind. Doesn't work. Outward peace does not work. That's called peacekeeping. Okay, you can agree with me, or you're getting no dinner. Okay, if if you don't agree with me, I'm going to buy another suit, or whatever. You know what I mean? It's it's threat. It's outward. It's it's peacekeeping. It's, It's warfare. By the way, there is spiritual warfare. Did you know that? We're not to be peaceful at any cost. We are not to compromise the Word of God to have peace. Well, pastor, I don't understand why you don't join these organizations. They don't believe like we do. They don't believe the Bible and so forth. Well, I can't do that because that would be external peace. But I can have internal peace of knowing that I'm right with God. That's your greatest challenge right now. Today, do you have peace with God? You don't have peace with God if you're not a believer because you're still lost in your sins. You may be religious like the Pharisees were, but you don't have peace with God. I don't know about you, but I'm very concerned and my priorities were set when I was a young man that I want my life to be blessed of the Lord first. And if you're a Christian and that's not your first priority, you will not have peace with God. You will not have the peace of God. Now, I'm going to give you two words. Peace with God means we're saved. We know the Lord. We we, we trust in Christ. What does that mean? Our sins are not separating us from God anymore. The Bible says that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The Bible says that Christ died on the cross for my sins and your sins. The Bible says here's God's negotiation. And there's really no negotiation. It's a dictation. And he says, I cannot let you into heaven without the holiness that I have. The Bible says, no man shall see the Lord who is not holy. Holiness is of the Lord. Well, because holiness is of the Lord, it must be given to us because we don't have it. Christ died on the cross for our sins. 
That's why he died. He didn't die because he was misunderstood. He didn't die because it was accidental. He died on the purpose of God. God foreordained that he would die for your sins. Just as if there was nobody else. He died for your sins. He loved you that much. Uh, when I discovered the fact that God loved me that much at, at the age of 15, and it was simplicity, exa I mean, exalted, that God loved me. All you have to know is God so loved the world. Are you, are you are whosoever? How many of you are whosoever's? Don't raise your hand. We all are. You don't need to raise your hands, but... Where whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible speaks of whosoever's, and we insert our name in there as the recipients of the peace of God that comes through the forgiveness of sins in repentance. That's peace with God. If you don't know Christ today, you don't have that peace. You may have religion, you may have be well educated, all those kind of things, but you don't have that peace until you know Christ. The second thing we need to understand is how do we have peace not only of God, but we have peace with God. Now, uh, the peace of God means that we're living in the will of God for our lives. It means that fellowship is maintained through repentance for specific sins. If I may do it this way, our relationship is found in Christ. It's by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Have you received that gift? I didn't say if you worked for it. I didn't say if you earned it. You can't do that. Works won't do it. The Bible says if it is grace, it's no more works. If it's works, it's no more grace. So the scriptures say to us, the grace of God hath appeared in Jesus Christ to give us this peace that we cannot have any other way. Now, not only do we have peace with God, but we have the peace of God through two things. First of all, fellowship. See, the Holy Spirit is in our body as a temple if we're saved. That's part of the salvation process. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by the baptism, we are all baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's part of the new birth. Part of the new birth is redemption. Part of the new birth is justification. Part of the new birth is the cleansing of our sins in the past, in the present, in the future. Because that way, the Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We receive holiness as part of that new birth. Stop. Have you received the new birth? Stop. Have you believed on Jesus Christ? The Bible says Romans 2, 8, and 9, and Romans says 10, 9, and 10 as well. It, the, with the mouth we confess, but with the heart we believe unto salvation. See, that's not external. That's internal. This peace with God. It's simple. But the simplicity of it, uh, you know, rush, it pushes many people away. Oh, I got to do something. I got to join the church. I got to be baptized. I got to give money. I got to do all those. No, 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 no. That's what people do who are in fellowship with the Lord, not in relationship with the Lord. The relationship is knowing Christ. But living for the Lord and in fellowship with the Lord is these two things. Fellowship is maintained how? Through what? Are you listening? Repentance for specific sins. Now, what do I mean by that? See, Christians can commit sin. Not you as a spirit, for we are spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. But the soul and the body can commit sin. The mind can commit sin. Many Christians are frustrated by the fact, well, I've trusted Christ. I had that wonderful joy of knowing him as my Savior, but I just can't seem to get going. I just can't seem to have peace. I can't seem to have any power. Here are the two reasons why you cannot. Some of you are absent too much in a Bible church. So you're not going to grow and learn and understand. Uh, children need this, especially when they're so young. That's why we started a school. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have Awana. We do all those things to help those children not only to trust Christ, but to grow in Christ so that they may have the peace of God as they live in this present evil world. Turn the noise on, the television on, politics on, and all of that. It will, it will be like a dump truck running over you. It is taking away your peace. It, it takes your attention away from God and starts putting it in the power of man and in politics and in countries and in cultures. And the Bible says all of them are going to go away. Everything that you see 
is temporal. Things you cannot see are eternal. You can't see God. You can't see love, but you can see it in action. You can't see peace, but it comes from internally. And if you're not working on the internal, the external isn't going to be productive or work. What makes you think you can manufacture your peace every day? You can only follow the will of God and the Word of God and know the Word of God. In Romans, where I'm doing theological teaching on Wednesday night, one of the things we get into in chapter 8 and 9 that's so heavy is the three, three words. First of all, know, K-N-O-W. What do you know? If you don't know the promises of God, how are you going to reckon the promises of God and live by them? And then if you reckon that, you can yield to the promises of God, those three words. But you have to do the work of the Scripture, which means study to show yourself approved. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to know how to get in touch and stay in touch with the Lord. How are you doing at staying in touch with the Lord? It's hard for me. I have to discipline my carnality. I have to discipline my body. I have to discipline my words. I have to discipline my ears. I have to discipline my thoughts. And that's part of the spiritual warfare of Ephesians 6. We should have the helmet of salvation. Know that we're saved by the grace of God, not think it. Then the Bible says we're to have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How much of the Word of God do you know? If you've been saved 30 years, you should know at least 80% of the Word of God. 90%. How many times not only have you read through the Bible, but how many scriptures have you memorized that help you? They are the thought. They are the idea when things oppress you, when things come upon you. That's living in fellowship with God. He lives through his word to us. See, he doesn't come down, you know, if you fall down or whatever happens. He doesn't, he doesn't chastise us, push us aside. He loves us. He's trying to help us get back up. He can't help you get back up if you don't know how to get back up. Right? Amen? Is that right or not? So we know the scriptures. We reckon the scriptures. Okay, this works. This is something that works. And then we yield to it. Now, let's go further. The Bible also says, that we live in the will of God for our lives. Oh, you say, well, I tried that. <laughs> no, it's not something you try at all. It's something you trust every day. You say, well, pastor, we know what you do on Sunday, at least part of the day. What do you do on Monday? I try to live in the will of God. What do you do on Tuesday? I try to live in the will of God or whatever I've got to do. Should I do this? Should I not? See, if you're not constantly in fellowship with the Lord, you are going to be a powerless Christian pushed around by the devil and by the spiritual warfare. You're not going to be victorious. You're not going to have the abundant life. You're not going to have the joy of the Lord. But Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, and all these things will be added unto you. Questions that you come up in life. Should I buy that or should I just repair? Should I live here or should I live there? Should I stretch myself to buy this or should I not? What should I do about those things? Well, until you learn the principles that God owns everything, you won't have any peace. Now, well, how do you think when you're living in the will of God that God owns everything? Well, you won't put God last. If you seek first the kingdom of God, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. When you become self-centered that you're smarter in your will than God's will is, which he's already told us what to do, you're going to lose not only your peace, but a lot more. How do I know this? Well, look at me. I know I bring this up once in a while and everybody who comes on a regular basis knows it. Look at me. I discovered America 82 years ago. The Lord found me and saved me when I was 15. I was immediately pressed by the Holy Spirit in the church that I was attending. It's a small church, a Bible church, to learn the Bible. I'm repeating this because some of you need it desperately. And I began reading the Bible. I went to high school. I had a job. I worked in a textile mill. I bought my own clothes. I did all that. You don't want to hear all that. But here's what you do need to hear. 
I put the priority of, of learning the Word of God, reading the Word of God, and memorizing the Word of God at the top of my every day. And by the time I was 18, I'd read the Bible through 16 times, not just the New Testament, the whole Bible. Well, why did you do that? Well, if it came up here <clears throat> through all these repetitions, it was easier to memorize. It was easier to find answers. Don't you think I had questions? I left home at 14, went to live with my brother, who's now in heaven. So I could go to school easier and work easier and serve the Lord. And I began to preach about when I was 16, called to preach. Why? You say, yeah, I know, but you're a fanatic. Hadn't turned out bad for me. I got a lovely family, a lovely wife. I got a lot of things that I never asked for. You see this suit? It's the best Walmart has. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I never bought a suit there. I'm not above buying a suit there. I, I bought a $19 suit one time when I started this church. It was olive green. I, I stopped wearing any colors of charcoal, black, gray, so forth. That's all I wear. I don't wear brown or tan. I mean, I should probably, but I don't. I bought this suit, paid $19 for it. I said, what a deal. I put it on, and, and I thought it looked great. I bought it and discovered later on that one of the sleeves were a little longer than the other one, so I had to drop this shoulder just a little to make the sleeves. <laughs> I've had all the experiences. You know how the Holy Spirit taught me? Buy less suits, stay with better colors, and pay more for them, and you get longer service. That's how I learned finances. I learned finances by cars, bad experiences. I learned finances by all kinds of ways because the scriptures were what I discovered and read and went by and still do. I don't spend money I don't have to impress people I don't like. I live modestly. You know what the result of that is? I have some money in the bank. I have, and you, you pay me a good salary, but I, I couldn't do this just on that. Uh, there were years when I was in career, uh, a, a career for corporations, Fortune 100 and 500, did a lot of training, consulting. And I used that time to help build this church. I didn't use that time to say, I want a high condominium out on the ocean. I want one of those $500,000 deals. This was many years ago. Now it's a couple of million. Boy, that will make me happy if I do that. That never crossed my mind. I knew prophetically red tide was coming. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, mean, I didn't know that. But I knew that God needed a Bible-believing church. And our children needed a Christian school. And we needed ministries. And we need to go throughout the world. And now we're on 94 fields of the world. Do you think I regret not having a huge house? Uh, you know, five, ten thousand, 10,000 or a high condominium. And, I'm, and it's all relative. The money I made, I worked hard for. And I wanted to put it in the Lord's work. And I've been putting money in the Lord's work since I was saved. Two weeks after I was saved, I even made up a tithe. And I'm saying this as a testimony, not to brag. But I have always been a tither. I give more than a tither. My wife and I give more than a tithe. We give a lot of money to missions. You know why I'm saying that? I'm trying to tell you that I like peace with God. I like peace where I can lay my head down at night. I don't want to rob Peter to pay Paul. I, I won't sound financial management. That's part of the peace that we have of God. Did you know you get along good with the right people and you attract the right friends and lose the ones who are acquaintances that you thought were friends if you live with good humor, the joy of the Lord, and follow the Lord and follow the Bible, you'll have the right friends around you. Some of us don't have peace. We try to be friends with somebody to be cool or to be hip or something, and we find out later on there's some bad results coming from that. Hmm, the amens have calmed down. We see somebody that we'd like to marry, and I've seen it happen over and over. 
Well, no, he's not a Christian pastor, but I'm going to make a Christian out of him. Listen, honey, if you don't have enough influence right now to make to, that he wants to know Christ, what do you think is going to happen after you get married? You can forget that. Okay, I'll go to church with you on Christmas and uh, New Year's and maybe Easter. You're going to always have strife and difficulties because your values are not the same. If you want the peace of God, you will have certain priorities and you'll live certain ways according to the Bible. I've been doing it since 15 years old, so don't tell me it can't be done. I've failed. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to stop saying this until I say I have had failures. I have had failures. Well, I bet you and Mrs. Lowe never, ever disagree. Shut up. She's a beautiful woman, has her own ideas about things. Well, I don't like that color. I don't either, sweetie. Let's get your color. You say, you mean you give up your color like that? Hey, happy wife, happy life. You know how it goes. There's a lot. Of, hey, listen, a bulldog can whip a skunk, but it ain't worth it. It's not worth it. I can win arguments, but it's not worth it. She's usually right anyway. That's what upsets me so much. Later on, I say, you know, that is right. I'm talking about those kind of things. What I want to say to you is peace, peace with God. Lord, there's, I don't want anything between us. Peace with God is I've trusted Christ. I've humbled myself to say I can't get to heaven. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I want your peace and I want to trust you as Savior. I did that when I was 15 years old. The sin was heavy on my heart. I was doing a lot of bad things. And I said, Lord, uh, I want somebody to love me. I, 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 I want to know God. And that's how it happened. Now, every time you think you've got a better deal than following God's will, you're a loser. Oh, I'm pretty smart. Yeah, I know. Is Satan smart? Is Satan, you know, the devil, is he smart? Is he smarter than you? Is he smarter than you? You don't think so? Child, you need to be careful. It's a dangerous world out there. Listen to me. Satan will give you 95% good stuff to get you into the 5% deadly poison stuff. And it'll turn out that way every time. The wages of sin is death. Soul that sinneth it shall die. Wake up. The happiest, most joyful, abundant life is when we have peace with God and when we pursue the peace of God. And the third thing I want to talk to you about is peace with other believers. Now, we do have peacekeeping in this church. I said that peacekeeping is eternal, it is external, it is. But we do have peacekeeping. What do I mean by that? The deacons, the officers, take care of all problems. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, if you're having disagreement or you're disgruntled or whatever, we try to pray with you and help you, but pastors don't solve that. Deacons do because in Acts chapter 6, the deacons took care of the murmurings between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Gentile widows were saying, we didn't get fed. The Jews, and so they were having trouble. They came to the apostle. The apostle said, choose out seven men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will charge them and appoint them over this stuff. The reason churches get in as much trouble as they do is pastors try to get out of their calling and get into the deacon calling and solve problems when God shows you what to do. Think about it. Churches don't organize according to the Word of God. Now, we love people. We do what Jesus said in Matthew 18. He said, if you have aught with a brother, go, don't bring your gift. You go solve that problem. If it, you can't solve it, then take a couple of witnesses with you. That's called deacons. And solve the problem. Amen? That's peace. Church, a church should have peace. You and I should be not all alike. You have a right to your opinions. You have a right to your preferences. You have a right to those things, but you don't have a right to go against the Scripture. Neither do I. As pastor, if I present heresy or I am immoral and it is proven, I'm out of here. 
Amen? So be it. Now, I'm going to stop here with this sermon because those three things are the key to victorious living. And Jesus brought it so wonderfully well as the great master teacher. He said, first of all, you have to have peace with God. you got to make your peace with God. Well, I'm not an enemy. Yes, you are. If you've never been saved, your sins are against the holiness of God. Your sins are against the grace of God. And he must, negotiate, he must take care of that because he's already taken care of it on the cross. Secondly, you need the peace of God. Peace of God is every day going about your business, running your business, doing your job, taking care of your family, all those things, but all under the priority ship of what God says works best so you don't have to do it twice or get in a bigger mess. You take the wrong road, and now you're not only going to be failing, but you're going to have other problems. I'll end this with one quick illustration. You remember, you remember the Wizard of Oz? We studied that when you were a kid, right? Remember the Cheshire Cat? Remember when she came to the forks in the road? She said, I don't know which way to go here. So she looks up and says, which way do you think I ought to go? He said, well, where do you want to go? She said, I don't know. He said, well, it doesn't matter what you take. If you don't know what your purpose and will of God is in your life, you're lost already as far as being a victorious Christian. I know that. And I've always known that. And I pray it, it's stressful. It's tough sometimes to say I want to stay with the will of God. I want to do the will of God. Do you think it's easy for me? It's no easier for me than it is for you. But I know I need the power of God in my life. I know I need to be right with the Father. I know I need the power of the Holy Spirit to keep me with the right attitude, the right words, and the right thoughts. Let's stand together, please, to pray. What is your need today? If you don't know Christ, I can tell you what your need is. Every person who doesn't know Christ should trust Him as Savior. Every, I, there's no exception. Listen, God doesn't have a, a culture over here that he loves better than this culture over here. God created all people, and God wants all to be saved, right? Whether they have no language in Indonesia or whether they're in New York City, wherever they are, God wants people to come to Christ so they can be eternal. Secondly, if you're not in the will of God, you're not happy, you don't have peace, you got turmoil, you keep reading books, you keep asking relatives, which probably is not the best. And thirdly, you shouldn't have any grief with any believer. You ought to settle it. Either agree to disagree, you can take the, the uh, loss, whatever you need to do. Peace is a wonderful thing. It's one of the great Beatitudes. Father, I pray that you will help us today to know your word, Help us to reckon your word in our life and help us to yield to your will. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let's sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I love that song. I've heard it all my Christian life.